Hey everyone, Steve Carter here, and I wish I could be with you live, but I am just getting back from Guatemala. Um, was on a, a missions trip, vi visiting some incredible villages uh, and with some partners um, that just are near and dear to my heart. Um, but I really have loved my time uh, partnering with Eric and the team here at Heartland for the series, Come to the Table. And what I want to do today is I want to tell you about the most unlikely disciple. Now, I'm sure I could look at my life and say, I I'm an unlikely disciple. You probably could be honest and look at your life and say, you're an unlikely disciple. But in the scriptures, there was one guy who, in my opinion, heads and tails, was just the most unlikely disciple. Why? Because he was considered a mamzer. What's a mamzer? It's someone who is half Jewish and half Greek. His father was not Jewish. His mother was. And because he wasn't fully Jewish, he had not yet been circumcised. If you don't know what circumcision is, ask your mom. But truly, what you need to understand is because he wasn't circumcised, he was unable to enter into the synagogue. So he couldn't study from a rabbi. He couldn't study the scriptures. Can you imagine, just because of one of your parents, if you were unable to actually enter in to Heartland? It'd break your heart. But this kid, this kid had a chutzpah, true passion. He longed to be a disciple. And one day, we learn in the book of Acts, chapter 16, that this, disciple, this young guy walks up to Paul, who is this traveling church planner, disciple maker, and he begins to strike up a conversation. Paul's a rabbi. Paul's looking for disciples. And he sees something in this young guy, this young man named Timothy. He literally begins to say, I think he could be one of my Talmudim. I think he could be a disciple of me and my teaching. But I imagine, as excited as he was, that probably some religious leaders pulled Paul aside and said, hey man, I know the kid has some spunk. I know the kid's excited, but I gotta tell you, he's a man, sir. He can't be your disciple. And what's incredible is in Acts 16, Paul does something so groundbreaking and he begins to see Timothy as his spiritual son. And he begins to make a way for Timothy to be his disciple. You fast forward to the end of Paul's life and he's in prison and he's writing his last letter. And you know who he sends it to? To his spiritual son, to the most unlikely disciple, to a man by the name of Timothy. And Timothy is leading in a city called Ephesus a really culturally relevant city. But Timothy is struggling with feeling quite timid. And Paul, in his last letter, has some words. But what I wanna do today is I wanna take you into seven verses that maybe you've read before, maybe you've not. But I wanna tell you, they're bizarre passages. And I love the Bible. I love learning from the Bible, but these seven verses, they're unlike any seven I've ever read. But what I began to recognize as I studied it, began to meditate on this word, that there is something that I think is truly for us today. If you have a Bible, turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. It says this, you then, my son, look at that language, my son. He's speaking as a spiritual father to a spiritual son. And look what he says. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, seriously, that's the hardest word for me to pronounce in the English language. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. And then look at verse 7. Reflect on what I'm saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. It's like Paul is writing to Timothy and he's like, hey man, I'm not going to tell you what this means. 
You have to figure it out. And so I took verse seven to heart. When I lived in the Northwest suburbs, I remember across the street from my house was a massive nature preserve. And I just began to read these seven verses over and over. I had note cards. It's kind of how I study. And I just had these note cards and a pen. And as I walked this nature preserve, I just began to kind of take some notes. And what I began to realize is that this message and this word that Paul has for his spiritual son, Timothy, is about three fields, a battlefield, an athletic field, and an agricultural field. And if we can actually unpack these three fields, it will give us further clarity for why we do what we do. And so let's begin with the first field, the battlefield. And look what Paul says. I'll read it one more time. He says, join with me in the suffering. Like a good soldier of Christ Jesus, no one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. So let me show you. A Roman soldier, they were a big deal in those times. A soldier was known for their sacrifice their willingness to sacrifice their one and only life for Pax Romana, for the peace and the glory of Rome. We get this. When we're ever at the airport and you're sitting there maybe waiting for a loved one and then all of a sudden you start to see these soldiers getting off the plane, walking in baggage claim, you just feel the sense of gratitude. Thank you for being willing to sacrifice. Number two, a Roman soldier was known for their obedience. And obedience is really two words that have been brought together. It means to listen and to respond quickly. And a soldier was known for their loyalty. They had to be loyal to the values and the mission of Rome. And lastly, they were devoted. They were devoted to following the orders of their commanding officer. What's amazing is in those days, a Roman soldier could only have one job. They didn't want their allegiance to be divided. So this soldier would only want to listen to the values and the commands of the superior officer, the commanding officer. Quick time out. Who's your commanding officer? Who's the loudest voice in your life? What's the thing that you hear that directs the steps that you take. As I was walking in this nature preserve, I felt like the Spirit said, who is your commanding officer, Steve? And I began to realize I didn't have one. I actually had seven. And I remember writing them down. As I started to write them down, I, I began to realize, not actually in order, that these were my commanding officers, me my agenda. Jesus, shame, fear, security, like the future and wealth and money. My boss. And then this asterisk represents two really, really traumatic experiences in my life. And maybe someday I'll, I'll share that personally and publicly. But as I was walking this nature reserve, preserve, I felt like God say, now rank them. Rank them. And this was just a litmus test for the loudest voice in my life. And I realized number one was me. Number two was Jesus. Number three was fear. Number four was shame. Number five was security. Number six was this asterisk. And number seven was my boss. I just started thinking about that. Is my whole life trying to please all of these commanding officers? And Paul's saying, hey, 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 you gotta understand, like a good soldier, you gotta understand, Timothy, who's your commanding officer? So I ask you again, Heartland, who's your commanding officer? Who's the loudest voice in your life? But then Paul goes to the second field, and it's an athletic field. And look what he says in verse five, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. Now, I love this because I love sports. I feel like I only have two gifts in life, preaching and trash talk. I, I, I can talk 
with anybody about sports. So I read this passage, I start coming alive because this is about an athlete who wants to train, an athlete who wants to be in the Olympics, an athlete who wants to win the victor's crown. And the Greek in this passage that's used when it's talking about athlete is this phrase, athlean nominos. And what this means is an athlete who is not just an amateur, but an athlete that is striving and pursuing professional greatness. I don't know about you, but maybe for some of you, you like to go down to your local gym and kind of play in a rec league sport. I think it's the most dangerous place. I think that there are a lot of people who walk into those gyms, they got just $200 shoes, they got Nike bags, they, they are just loaded and they're nice. They're nice before the game. But then all of a sudden, when that ball is thrown up and the, and the ref blows the whistle and the clock starts counting down, those nice guys turn into rec league monsters. And, and I've only played in a couple games because it's too scary for me. But I started to recognize that there is a wild difference between a rec league person and someone who is trying to play for the Chicago Bears. Did you know that when someone gets drafted, one of the first things that happens is that they are handed a playbook. It's on an iPad. And if they're a defensive player, there are hundreds, if not almost 1,000 plays that they are handed in an iPad. And they gotta memorize them. And if they don't know the playbook, I'll tell you what, they're not gonna have a job. And I started to really think about this. And Matt Nagy, the coach of the Chicago Bears, he has a phrase that he wants every one of his players to be obsessed with football, to be obsessed. To be obsessed with being the best that they can be for their team. And as I started recognizing this, an athlete can only be as good as they understand the playbook. And if everybody commits to the playbook, they have a chance to be victors. Quick time out. Have you ever thought about this? It's, it's kind of like rec league sports to professional athlete, but we could have a leather bound Bible. I, I could have some Hillsong worship playing and literally, literally not orient my one and only life to be a true disciple. I, I could literally live my life as a rec league Christian. Got the Bible, got the worship, got the right words. I got one hour a week that I put into church, but this isn't what discipleship is about. Discipleship is about understanding how we are called to live. And every one of us, every one of us has to understand as disciples, what's our playbook? What's so beautiful is in 2 Timothy, Paul writes about this. You know, he says in 2 Timothy chapter three, what the playbook is. He says this, that the scriptures, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I believe this. I believe that for true disciples, this book is everything. Now, let me take you back to the ancient Near East and being a little six-year-old. You were never taught the scriptures. You were never able to study the scriptures until you were the age of six. And this is what would happen. A mother and father would walk their six-year-old son or daughter into the local synagogue and there would be the rabbi. And the rabbi would walk up to the child and say, my son, my daughter, put out your hand and the little child will put out their hand and then the rabbi would say close your eyes and so the, the little child would close their eyes and put their hand over their eyes and, and then with one hand open the other hand covering their eyes the rabbi would put honey all over the child's hand now you got to understand that these kids they ate grapes they ate bread some fish some figs they never had honey before. This is like a six-year-old eating Skittles for the very first time. And then the rabbi would say, my son or my daughter, taste and see. 
And so the child would just taste the honey and their eyes would open up. You remember parents, the first time at their one-year-old birthday that you gave your child like a chocolate piece of cake or some ice cream or a sprinkled donut and their eyes opened up and there was so much joy, but they were also a little frustrated because you've been feeding them like Gerber, like compressed spinach, and now they have been able to eat something sweet. And then the rabbi, this is what the rabbi would do to this child. The rabbi would say, my son or my daughter, what does it taste like? And the only words that this child could say is, it's, it's, it's sweet. And then the rabbi would say, you're right. My son, my daughter, that's what the word of God is. It's sweet like honey. And when you dive into this book, you will taste and see the sweetness of our God. Quick time out. If you're honest, how many of you feel like this book has lost its sweetness? Maybe there was a moment or a time where this book just, it gave you life. You loved it. But for some apparent reason, maybe it's just collecting some dust on a shelf. And maybe you're wondering why life isn't going the way that you would hope it to. Maybe this is just that reminder that Paul wanted for Timothy. To know this book. Because if you know this book, you will understand that you are a victor. You're not a victim. And you're not creating stories where other people are villains. You are a victor because of Christ. And that's what this book tells you. Another thing about this book is oftentimes when I study the scriptures for a teach, I'm kind of over it. I'm kind of like looking into it. And I'm asking questions of the text. But in the morning, when I sit in my chair, when I open up God's word, you know what I do? I'm actually choosing to sit under it. And I'm allowing the words from this book to actually ask questions of my life. That's the difference. And when we as a church can actually lean in to the word and see this, not as just old, kind of archaic language and stories, but actually, words for today, words that feed our soul. I love what it says, all scripture is like God breathed. That's where we get that word inspired. It's like, it's like heaven's breath. It is what is giving us life to face the trials of today so that we can be thoroughly equipped for every good work. But it's crazy. It's because Paul doesn't stop there. He goes to a third field. And this third field is an agricultural field. And look what he says, verse six, the hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Now, I don't know if you've ever experienced shaking the hand of a farmer. Don't do it. Don't do it. Because their hands are so strong. I have a buddy of mine, his father-in-law is a farmer. And I made that one mistake once and the kindness, sweetness of this farmer man, literally, his hand enveloped mine. He crushed my knuckles. And the next time I saw him, he came in, I just gave him a fist bump. I tried to go up high, gave him a fist bump. Just know their hands are so strong. Why? Because farmers are hardworking. They're hardworking, long hours. They get up at sunrise, they work past sunset. And what are they doing? They're getting the soil ready. They're scattering seeds. They're watering it. They're protecting all of their, their crops from disease or insects. And you know what farmers are good at? They're good at waiting. I'm not very good at waiting, but farmers are really good at waiting. And when those crops come, they know how to throw a party. I don't know if you've ever seen what happens in Italy when they get those first grapes. And there is a celebration in the ancient Near East, many of the Jewish festivals were centered around a harvest. Why? Because it was a gift from God. These crops are gonna feed and it was a gift from God. And so I found myself thinking about this. The first field, a battlefield, who's my commanding officer? 
the second field, an athletic field, what's my playbook? And then the third field, what am I trying to harvest? And then something hit me as I was walking on this nature preserve. I began to realize why some people do the things that they do. Let me give you an example. I've made this grid. This grid makes sense to me. Maybe it doesn't for you, but you're a little stuck. I got only a few minutes left. But let me tell you, I got commanding officer, the CO. PB, peanut butter, not really, playbook. Harvest, that makes sense. I started thinking about this. Let's say that your commanding officer is money. That's what you think about. I gotta make more money. It's the loudest voice that you hear. It is what directs your decisions. What can I do? What must I do to make more? Well, what's your playbook gonna be? I don't know, probably the Wall Street Journal, probably Forbes Magazine. You're gonna look, maybe the, the life and the, and the readings of Jack Welsh. You're gonna probably study that. And what is it gonna harvest? You're probably gonna harvest some more money. But I also bet you're probably gonna harvest greed. And underneath this greed is gonna be this question is, is there more? Because there's never just enough. Well, maybe, maybe for some of you, like me growing up in Southern California, maybe your commanding officer is image. It's what you think about, how people see you, how you look, what you wear. You probably think about this, your playbook will probably be, I don't know, Cosmo, maybe GQ, maybe some kind of next fashion line. Recently, I was on an airplane flying home and I'm flipping through the magazine and the American Way magazine from American Airlines. I get to the very end and I come across this ad and this ad is of a 72 year old man. This is what he looks like. And when you see this guy, he literally in this ad has a six pack, 72 year old, perfect abs. And this whole like kind of ad and article is literally like, hey, follow this guy's playbook and you literally can look like him. I started thinking about this. God forbid this 72 year old man with six pack of abs, God forbid he's in the hospital on his deathbed. I imagine his family's nearby, grandkids, son, daughter, wife, they're probably all like huddled around bedside. Maybe they're talking. And then I just imagine the son walking up to his dad. His dad's just laying there. He's got his hospital gown on. And I just, I just imagine his son's like, Dad, can you do one thing for me? One more thing. And the dad says, I'll do whatever you want. The son goes, will you just take off your gown and will you show me your six pack one more time? Nobody does that. Nobody does that ever. That would never happen. That would be the most bizarre, weird thing ever. And here's the crazy thing. When you find yourself around when the last breath and the last moments of someone, you're not talking about looks. You're not talking about image. You know what you're looking for? It's a blessing. You know what you're looking for? It's another minute. You know what you're looking for? It's a time to sing a hymn or a song. You're looking for just a word, a memory, one last story. And I think about when image is our commanding officer and some thing to help us live this out is our playbook. What are we gonna harvest? Yeah, sure. We might harvest better looks again. I try to take care of my temple. I think, it's a, I think it's a good thing, but it shouldn't be the loudest voice in our life. Or maybe we'll have better clothes. But I bet, I bet we'll also struggle with ego. I bet we'll start to see ourselves in a certain way. And little by little, this desire for a good image turns into vanity. 
I know some people, their commanding officer is shame. Maybe that's you. It's almost like a shame storm comes over and it just, it just rains. Or just like the clouds just come and your day went from just beautiful sunsets and, and sunrises and the skies were so blue to just absolute gray, in just a matter of seconds. It's like the, the drapes just begin to close in and you can't seem to open it. It's just, it's just shame. And, and, and literally people who struggle with shame, what becomes their playbook? Anything that will numb them out just to turn that voice off. And it could be Netflix. It could be social media. It could be a number of things. I also know that there are some sincere Christ followers whose shame is their commanding officer, but the, the Bible is their playbook. And the craziest thing happens is that when they actually read this, they don't read God's love. They actually read this God who's shameful towards them and angry towards them. And what does it end up harvesting in them? Is more shame within and more judgment towards others. I began to realize, man, if shame is your commanding officer and you're just trying to numb out, what are you going to harvest? You're going to harvest a life of escape. This is just what you're going to do. You're just going to look for ways to escape. And I think this is what Paul wanted for Timothy. And if I'm honest, this is what I desire for you. You have to really ask the questions. Who's my commanding officer? What is my playbook? And what am I trying to harvest with my one and only life? And Paul makes it very, very clear. Jesus. Jesus. Being a disciple, a Talmudim of Jesus, following his life. And how are we, can we follow his life? By understanding the playbook by understanding the scriptures, by orienting our one and only life and living under it, studying it, finding it to be sweet like honey. And you know what? When Jesus is your commanding officer and the Bible is your playbook, you know what you're going to harvest? You know what you're going to go after? The only thing, the one and only thing that you can take into the next reality, and that's people. That's people. And when we get this right, it's an absolute game changer. I think about coming to the table and sitting as a pastor for almost 20 years. I've sat with a number of people and, and, and I begin to recognize what in their life they're beginning to harvest. And sometimes I'll just play it backwards. I begin to recognize, man, what was the playbook that got them to harvest that? And then I'll play it back a little bit more and I'll begin to discern and discover through questions and being curious what the loudest voice was. And you'll just see how it can be so easy for people to just drift, drift. With your one and only life, Paul wanted Timothy to reflect on this, that to live his life like a good soldier, to sacrifice, to be obedient, loyal, and devoted to one commanding officer, not many like mine. And I remember when I found this to be true on that nature preserve, I just fell to my knees and just said, God, please help me. Please help me see your son as the true and loudest voice in my life. And let me see this book, not just as ancient stories, disconnected from today, but more vital for today than ever before. And let this book be heaven's breath to teach me, to train me, to correct me, to help me be equipped to go after and to love and to serve and to help those that are in need so that they can taste and see what I've been able to taste and see, that my God, that our God is so sweet and good, a God who is with us and a God who is for us. Who's your commanding officer? Who does it need to be today? What's your playbook? And what if just in this season, you decided, I'm gonna start over with this book. And if I could encourage you, I would just say, choose a gospel. That's going to help you learn what Jesus was all about. 
I choose Luke because I, I like him because he's a little bit more of a historian, doctor. He, he writes with just, it's just a unique sense of the Jewish culture and what's happening. But don't just try and read through it. Just go slow. And if you don't understand something, get a question. Write it down. And then show up the weekend that Eric Parks is speaking and just get in line and ask him that question. The questions that you wrote down. He'll love it. Or if I'm here, ask me. I'd love it. Ask one of the pastors. They'd love it. Can you imagine if every one of us in this season said, Jesus, the Bible, I bet we'd walk into Starbucks. We'd walk into the marketplace. We'd walk down the streets in our neighborhood. We'd walk into our school with the eyes that God had. The eyes for every living person because they all matter to him. My brothers and sisters, may Jesus be your commanding officer. May this book never lose its sweetness. And may we always understand that this has always ever only been about people. I'll see you next weekend. Grace and peace.